Welcome to the Future of Strategy Fireside Chat this afternoon with Fred Hochberg. Fred is the author of a fantastic book called Trade is Not a Four Letter Word. Um, I think the title is absolutely inspired, but more than just an author, he has also been uh, the chairman of US Exim Bank under the Obama administration and was deputy acting administrator of the SBA under the Clinton administration. He's also a huge human rights campaigner generally and also for LGBTQ rights in particular. Fred, it's a marvellous privilege, absolutely fantastic to welcome you uh, to the Future of Strategy and a real privilege to have this opportunity to spend half an hour with you just chatting. I'd say to um, the audience, if you're listening, um, please bring in any questions you want through uh, Q&A um, and Fred and I will try and deal with them as they, as they come through. Fred, let me start with the question that will be on everyone's lips. What inspired the title? Why trade is not a four letter word? <laughs> well, I think, uh, first of all, good to see you again. We last met in Berlin and I'm excited to be here, uh, albeit virtually. Um, uh, one thing I did notice working for President Obama from 2009 to 2017, is how the mood on trade got increasingly sour over that period of time. Uh, as, as chairman of the Export Input Bank, you know, my role was primarily in promoting exports and ensuring they had the financing to be sold overseas and be competitive. But people started confusing a trade with globalization, with outsourcing, and there was just not a lot of clarity on the subject. So that was part of it. Uh, when I finished my time in the administration, I was uh, invited uh, by both the Kennedy School at Harvard and the U University of Chicago Institutes of Politics. And in both places, you teach a course, uh, a seminar, a sort of non-credit seminar to undergraduates. And I tried to think, well, what will actually interest 18, 20 year olds to take an extra hour and a half out of their day, uh, eight times uh, in a semester? And it was not going to be resetting America's trade agenda in the 21st century. It was not going to be a history of the Export Import Bank. So I came up with, I said, what would be provocative? And at least if, if I got them in the door the first week, I had a chance of get, keeping them the second through the eighth week. And that's where the title came from. It became the working title of the book, and I never found a better one. Um, and even the idea of the book really came from my students and a number of our guest speakers who at the end of a session said, why aren't you making this into a book? Which I frankly never ever considered writing a book in my entire life. <laughs> um, well, it's it's quite an undertaking, isn't it? So, so tell everybody um, the themes. I mean, you're identifying six reasons, particularly why, why, why trade is an important part of our daily lives. And it's it's a lot more than just sort of economic growth, isn't it? It's It's a huge amount more. Well, yes. And first of all, we've been trading for thousands and thousands of years. And uh, what I chose to do is pick uh, six products, six goods, really, um, to try and make the case and explain how trade impacts our lives. And I, I, I started with the Taco Bowl, since uh, President Trump made that so famous during his campaign, saying the best Taco Bowls were at T Trump Grill. And just how the Taco Bowl came to be. Um, how the foods we eat in America have been so influenced by global trends. You know, things like in America, corned beef and cabbage, which we associate with Ireland and St. Patrick's Day, was actually invented in New York. Chop suey was invented in New York. Uh, and the taco bowl was invented at Disneyland. So um, I, I, I use the taco bowl. Then I talk about bananas, uh, just so we understand fruits, vegetables, the, the kinds of things, at least in America, that we take for granted. We can have strawberries and blueberries 12 months a year. Uh, and in fact, now that we import blueberries, for example, uh, consumption of blueberries has more than doubled per capita in the last 15, 20 years. So it did not take sales away from blueberry producers, it actually increased them. Um, and then just briefly, I, I talk about the iPhone, which, um, we're all attached to and would not exist were it not for global trade. Um, I explored what goes into an automobile. Uh, the most American car when I wrote the book was the Honda Odyssey. Uh, this year it's a Ford. 
um, and the rankings keep changing. But for many years, it was either a Honda or a Toyota. And I kind of conclude with looking at higher education, which is a service export, which frequently people don't even understand what a service export is, and it's an important one um, in the US and globally. And then lastly, Game of Thrones, um, really talking about Hollywood, television, music, entertainment um, is an important uh, service export, one that we excel in the United States and is frequently overlooked in all the discussion and debate around trade. I think it's absolutely fascinating because I, I can remember um, once as a very naive economics lecturer um, talking about a global pizza and, um, you know, obviously out of the same intellectual stable. But I think I think this point that you make about about everything being in, interactive in a way and everything being integrated is very important. I mean, anybody who watches um, English English soccer football, for example, knows that you know you can end up with three English players on the field, and the rest are global, and the brand is global, and this is this is exporting as well. But I think I think you're right to point out right at the very beginning that 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 this has all become rather sour, and it started actually with um, you know under the Obama administration actually some 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 sort of serious concerns about China. Um, and obviously tariffs as well. And that began to feed through into this sort of sense of economic nationalism and then into a more sort of um, direct campaign um, against, and, and sometimes it's felt like it's almost against free trade. Now, um, trade and globalization aren't the same thing, are they? They've been, so, so trade can be seen quite separately from some of the other patterns which perhaps have created inequality, um, have created um, disadvantage and so on. So, I, I mean, that's something that you must be concerned about. Well, I think, you know, first of all, you know, trends are happening so much faster. If you, uh, you know, I know that's a trite to say, but, you know, the move from an agrarian farming economy to an industrial economy to a post-industrial, you know, that took a place maybe over 75 years. We're now seeing it, and I think this pandemic is, is going to accelerate a lot of these trends. Um, things are happening, even things that might have taken five years are, are happening within a matter of months. I mean, uh, clearly uh, business travel is, I think, going to be forever changed. You know, we're doing this on Zoom um, and we're going to see uh, an integration in terms of the complexity of, of bringing a conference together like we're doing today becomes far simpler when we don't have, everybody has to fly to one place on one time on one day. So I think that these, there's gonna be a repatterning of our economy and, um, and that's part of globalization. And trade is obviously sort of a subset of that and a component of that. And one thing actually thinking about this book, I mean, I go at length in the book to try and explain what a supply chain is. Um, now everybody seems to know what a supply chain is because they think about our medicines, uh, <clears throat> vaccinations, ventilators, things such as that, masks. Um, and all of a sudden people are talking about supply chain where I never would have imagined that when I wrote this book and it came out earlier this year. So you're absolutely right that supply chains are, are almost definitive proof of how integrated the world is. And, you know, this sort of um, this was vaccine diplomacy versus vaccine protectionism and nationalism. It's become the debate, hasn't it, around trade. And everybody now seems to have some kind of partial knowledge of, of the world of trade. Are we actually seeing or are we going to see um, a shift in the way politicians are viewing trade, do you think? Well, I think we've already seen it. I think that um, part of the problem is, and it's certainly in the United States, but it's not unique to the United States. I think in, in richer countries, um, people at uh, the lower end of the wage scale have really been hurt. Um, Well-educated, richer people have benefited in both rich countries and poor countries. Uh, workers in poor countries have benefited because they're, uh, China is the perfect example, but the number of people who have come out of poverty in the last 20 years due to trade is enormous, but many workers, many uh, manufacturing workers um, have lost ground, frankly, in the last two decades. A lot of that has to do with automation, but of course some of it has to do with trade. And here in the United States, we just finished an election and the impact, for example, of NAFTA, which I talk about in the book, uh, has stayed with us for a long time and in part because the states that were 
really had the biggest brunt of it were manufacturing states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio. And they also happen to be battleground states, which we, in the United States, meaning states where elections are really fought on and won or lost frequently in those four or five, maybe eight different states. Um, so issues that bubble up in these battleground states have a certain resiliency. And it's not just trade. I mean, I'll give you two other examples. You know, uh, the issue of the US relations with Cuba very much impact the Cuban population, which has a large concentration in Florida. And it is one of the, one of the reasons, there are others, why Florida is a battleground state. And lastly, uh, fracking, which is a, a form of extracting uh, natural gas and oil from uh, rocks and rock formations deep in the Earth's surface, below the Earth's surface, uh, is a very contentious issue in Pennsylvania. And all of us, so we had a lot of talking about fracking during our campaign, although it is probably not the most central issue facing the United States. So in our country, Based on an election system, the Electoral College has a lot to do with the, the saliency of some of these issues, and trade certainly one of them. So, I, I mean, since you started talking about it, and I, I, I promised myself that we would keep this event politics free, but, um, but, <laughs> but it's particularly in the climate that we're living in at the moment, and the extent to which trade has been well weaponized, politicized, call it what you will. But, I mean, on in Europe um, and in Asia, I mean, I think it's fair to say that the US election this time round was one of the most watched events. Um, and, and there were a lot of us who had a couple of sleepless nights watching voting and re-voting, watching counting going on. Um, do you think that we will see a, a more multilateral, a more conciliatory tone now? Do you think um, do you think it is accurate to say that a new regime will come in with a more um, collaborative trade agenda? Because some of the issues around sustainability, around um, around inclusiveness, um, are so important now um, for the world. Well, uh, let me try and unpack that a little bit. First of all, I mean. Uh, President-elect Biden, who has been on the sort of national and global uh, arena uh, for almost half a century, uh, certainly believes in alliances, certainly believes in building relationships with other countries. So I think um, he comes at this very, very differently. Um, you know, after 9-11, for example, uh, and the global financial crisis, both George Bush, Hank Paulson and others believed in the world order. So they were trying to put that back together. Uh, under Donald Trump, we had someone who does not believe in the world order, does not believe in collaboration and finding common ground and, and disagreeing where you have to disagree. So uh, we're in a very different place. I think the pandemic for one underscores the need to work together. Uh, maybe the best vaccine and treatments may not come from the country any of us individually live in. And also many of the pharmaceutical companies are global in nature in terms of their research, their innovation, their manufacturing. So I think that changes. And we also see that um, something like a pandemic is global in nature. Um, Ebola, we were able to contain Ebola through a lot of work. And I'm proud to say a lot of work through uh, President Obama, Vice President Biden, and, and Ron Klain, who's his new chief of staff. So uh, these things are more global. Uh, at the same time, Donald Trump has, uh, to his credit, sort of called the question on trade, what's fair in trade, what's fair with China? And I think that has irrevocably changed the dynamic with China. No, it's one thing that we find Democrats and Republicans agree on, maybe not in every aspect, but agree that uh, China has been a bad actor. China has not been a reliable partner. Um, it may have been high hopes that China would, be, would embrace so more Western values. That just didn't happen. It was not in their interest. Uh, and uh, addressing China is gonna be formidable, not just for President-elect Biden and Vice President Harris in the next four years, but well beyond that. 
and I think there's general um, alignment around the idea that this is actually a requirement for organisations like the World Trade Organisation, um, like the European Union, and you know the, the sort of um, the allies of the United States. I, I actually think we do need to think uh, seriously about how we bring China into the fold, but work with with managing the process and proper reform around all of that. So, I mean, how how will President elect Biden align, for example, with the EU? Is this likely to be a priority? Is it likely to be something that um, something that he focuses on in order to isolate China? Because obviously, with reset just signed recently, that makes it, it's another big trading block that has China in it that makes life perhaps a bit more difficult. Yes, I mean, it's hard to tell right now. I mean, you know, uh, just later today, uh, President-elect Biden, Vice President House will be announcing uh, some of the more senior members of the cabinet. Uh, they've announced the White House. So we have to wait and see what's gonna happen in our Commerce Department, trade, US trade representative and so forth. But clearly, um, uh, from what I know of President-elect Biden, and I've known him for, 30 odd years and obviously served in the administration. I think, you know, he certainly wants and believes that we are better off if we find ways to work together. But that said, we have some large issues. We have a lot of tariffs with China that have to be dealt with. They're not going to, I don't believe they're going to just disappear. Um, we have steel and aluminum tariffs with our allies. That's got to be navigated. Um, we have issues of the WTO. We have our own issues here in our country, something called Trade Promotion Authority, which um, yeah, yeah. Means Congress year, votes yeah. up or down on a trade deal. There's this potential trade agreement with the UK. So there's a lot of things on the um, on the docket, so to speak, that are left open. So I have a couple of questions coming in from the audience. And the first is this, um, uh, and again, it's a deeply political question about the, the UK um, and the UK's new way of approaching global trade, which um, is um, seen as quite singular muscular trampling of free trade. Do you think that will lead to other countries adopting a similar approach? Or do you think actually the UK is increasingly isolating itself? Well, I, I think, you know, it's hard to examine what's the internal dynamics in different countries, you know. Uh, that was very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, in, in the United States, you know, when we've had trade deals that have passed through Congress, they frequently have passed with 75% of the votes came from Republicans, 25% came from Democrats. Um, even though Americans by and large from Gallup and other polls uh, are supportive of free trade, thinks trade is good for our economy, good for innovation, uh, good for our place in the world. Uh, when it comes to actually voting that way in Congress, it's very different. So I think it's, we, you know, different governments are going to have to sort of check the pulse of voters. And those can be very mercurial when it comes to issues around trade. I, I think certainly from a UK perspective, it's 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 almost um, can the UK achieve its vision of actually changing the way in which we think the world thinks about global trade? Is its is its approach um, actually one that's 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 now on the wane because obviously it, it follows along a, a sort of more Trumpian view of world trade, or is it something that 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 is actually going the direction of trade is going in that in that way? I'm sorry, ask me that. Again. I'm not sure. I'm following so, on that. so, so it's really about whether or not the UK can can run this can run this um, structure of trade, which is very isolationist and free trade oriented, and lots of individual trade agreements and so on. Is that the future, or is it something? And can that be the way in which world trade operates, or is it something that something that actually is very focused on what the UK wants at the moment? Well, I think it's focused on what the UK wants, and I think that you know there is a lot of sort of disarray at the moment. Uh, Richard Haas of the Council Bar Relation wrote a book called oh, The World in Disarray. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of- That's uh, what it says on the tip. <laughs> you mentioned RECEP, the, the agreement uh, with China and 14 countries in Asia. Um, we have uh, a little bit of a sort of standstill at the World Trade Organization. Uh, in terms of the new DG and where the director general and where the United States stands on that issue. There are also this discussion of plurilateral trade agreements, multilateral trade agreements. So I think there's just, there's a lot of somewhat, um, it's a lot of moving parts at the moment. So um, 
I'm not trying to duck it, but I'm not sure I can give you a, a, a clear answer because the data is not that clear. You know, yeah. the UK and the EU haven't formed an agreement yet. So there are a lot of open items. And one of the things I explore in the book is we're more integrated than many people would like to believe. You know, I use the example of the iPhone. I'm getting my new one soon, but it, you know, the components come from 43 different countries. Um, it would not exist without the movement of trade. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we can have trade without trade agreements that, you know, there's, and my hunch would be, that's the direction the US is gonna take for the next several years. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see a lot of new trade agreements coming down. It, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in, in, in that structure, the focus then becomes on reform, doesn't it? Because um, I mean, certainly, certainly Mr. Lighthizer has been very critical of the number of trade agreements he's talked about. He's tra talked about the number of free trade agreements that are being negotiated outside of the World Trade Organization as being something that's of deep concern. He's called it an arms race or, you know, a battle that, that's being fought to be part of trade agreements. So it's the world is becoming very complex complicated, but ever more integrated because of these connections across supply chains. So I have another question here from the audience, which is um, the perspective is very interesting, but how do we simplify that message? We're very complex. The world is complex. And the secondary corollary question to that is how do we simplify the messages on trade and what can we do up to three actions um, that we can implement um, to reduce inequalities in trade and make it sustainable? Because that's a way of addressing the issues around globalization. Well, I think uh, to try and go to the, in terms of issues around inequality. I think what, what we need to do, um, and, and this pandemic has, has brought this to the fore, is people's lives are being disrupted. And many jobs will not re come back the way they were before. We have a, a large number in the US, what we call long-term unemployment, people out of jobs for more than six months. Um, that's only going to accelerate with automation and artificial intelligence. So actually, thinking clearly about how are we gonna prepare people for the change in their job function and in their jobs. Uh, I remember when I was at Exim, um, I was with a banker in London and he said that um, uh, famine and starvation is what toppled governments in the 18th and 19th century. And it's gonna be jobs in the 20th and 21st century. So really thinking about how we're preparing citizens uh, a term I, I learned uh, in the book, uh, it was not my invention called, it was called lifelong readiness. Um, not lifelong learning, but we always have to be ready for, uh, it's like when you have a hurricane or a bad storm, you fill up the car with gas, you make sure you have extra food in the house. So how do we prepare ourselves, all citizens, to realize that the, their jobs are going to be changing, changing rapidly and therefore have a degree of preparedness for that. And there's a role for the government to do that and the private sector. So that's, that's one large issue and that's not a small thing to accomplish. Uh, and the other thing is, hopefully we have a better understanding today in the pandemic as part of, that we are interconnected, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's climate and whether it's trade, these are all interconnected and trying to untie that knot uh, is not going to be very practical. So it's about it's about understanding work. I, I would say there's a very large technology element in all of that as well, understanding how we live with technology and then understanding integration, global inter integration, but the importance of collaboration around that as well. So um, these are themes that have come out very strongly in the last couple of days that, that we actually all need to, to work together. And I think the big challenges ahead um, are are likely to make us need to focus more collaboratively. And we've talked about COVID to some extent and said that's made us very aware of this thing called the supply chain, which is immensely complicated. Um, and none of us really knew it happened until, and it was important until um, we suddenly realized that we were very dependent on one supplier and that medicines needed to flow around the world and the R&D needed to flow around the world. Right. So, I mean, I, I guess, my, my question would be, um, what are the big issues for trade in the coming, in, in the future? We've called this event the future of strategy. Um, we want to have action plans as, and ways of getting towards a positive future for trade because I think it's incredibly important. But 
where are the big issues? What are the big mega trends that we need to be dealing with? Apart from, you know, the way we work, which I think is clear. Uh, what, what are the other things? Is it technology? Is it sustainability? Is it equality? Well, I, you know, it's hard to pick one, but I, I would actually say data, um, which is not well understood, um, but is clearly uh, a critical one. Uh, and I think that, you know, globally we're seeing a rethinking of what is a monopoly and monopoly power. You know, it had been for decades, uh, what was the impact on consumer pricing and choice? Um, it's now going to have to just, the fact that data, uh, the large tech companies that deal with social media, whether it be Facebook, Amazon, Google, Apple, you know, you name it, uh, how they handle data, how they handle privacy. Um, and I think one of the risks we have is that we were, may have a really a, a much more bifurcated world than we had with sort of the um, free world and behind the iron curtain, we're going to have two to very different worlds around data. Uh, a Chinese one, which is going to be much more tied to government, much more tied to surveillance. Um, and a lot of that equipment's being sold in the Mideast and we're probably in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And one that's a more free and open system. Um, and how we, and, you know, countries will not want to have to choose, but they will wind up choosing. Uh, the whole issue with Huawei is just the beginning. So I think that when it, data is one of the ones that is a right on the, right in front of us and much more complicated to understand than where was your car manufactured or uh, uh, capital goods, you know, goods that people understand that much more. That is simpler to the earlier question. That's a simpler thing to understand. Where do fruits and vegetables come from? We have an issue constantly with the UK and the EU around chicken farming, you know, we have a standard in the United States, there's a standard that, in the, that exists in the UK and the EU, we, and how we square those, and that's, that is relatively, I think, simple versus um, the issues around data. I, I think I think it's impossible to understate the importance of data. But the other big theme that we've been talking about is sustainability as well. And I think um, certainly President-elect Biden has a very strong concern around that. How do you use, just, just to conclude, how do you use um, the, the trade system to incentivize sustainability and what should we be measuring there because obviously from a data perspective the data we see on climate change the data we see on inequality the data we see on um on non-sustainability of trade um in all sorts of ways how do we get get to that big picture where trade is sustainable well first of all i think that under president trump the u.s was an outlier was, the, was one of the few countries that did not acknowledge that we need to address climate issues. Um, so I think, and so I think that that is a substantial change, both with uh, President-elect Biden and his naming um, John Kerry, Secretary, former Secretary of State uh, John Kerry to work on climate issues. So I think that uh, that very much moves the United States in the direction and in alignment with much of the rest of the world. But, you know, the, when you ask about trade, I think the two things that come to my mind, Rebecca, one is just whether there'll be border adjustment taxes based on what kind of uh, power and energy was used to create product, goods and services. Um, and the other thing, one of the things, at least I think we made a mistake in the United States, we did not sufficiently uh, provide support for people whose jobs were upended and their communities are upended by trade. And we need to figure out a way to do that for people for whose lives and, and incomes and standard of living gets upended by a change to green energy. So people who are coal miners and uh, in oil rigs are going to need to transition and the government needs to take a stand in that and a role in that if we want to bring those people along and not have them outside the system. Fred, thank you so much for your time. Um, technology intervened in the middle, but I don't think we lost. We I don't kept think our we, audience. I'm, I'm, we, I'm, I'm very shocked. <laughs> please, we kept you did our a great audience. job. <laughs> yeah, well, I was running out of things to say. I was going to have to start singing a song in, after a little while, but um, that really would have got rid of everybody. But but th thank you very much indeed for your time and, and your insights. I mean, for me, um, my, my takeaways from this conversation are that 
trade is a force for good in the world, that um, we need to understand how trade is changing, that COVID has created some big shifts in the way we perceive trade, certainly around supply chains, but around technology and the role of technology as we've witnessed this afternoon as well. And that actually the key thing about trade is understanding the people within it, because the people within it and the connections between those people and whether or not they feel they're hard done by by the process of trade is what will make it sustainable in the end. So, Fred, thank you very, very much indeed. Really appreciated your time. Um, you've answered all the all the audience questions um, extremely well. And um, it was a privilege to talk to you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Good to see you too. Thank you. Thank you.